Okay, and thank you for the introduction, um, and thanks everybody for being with us today. Um, hopefully by the end of this presentation, um, we'll have a little bit more clarity on item writing itself, um, how challenging that can be, and then in addition, um, what our item writing, how that impacts our students. <clears throat> so for starters, I just kind of want to talk about, and this will be a little bit of my personal experience, but I, as I've talked with other faculty members here, um, and also uh, at meetings, I think this is a common occurrence, and a lot of us, uh, specifically in the pharmacy education realm, um, we were trained as clinicians, and we may have had residencies, um, and we may have had other training, but that mostly was focused at pa direct patient care. Um, I know medicine, from things I've read and my understanding, also has a similar experience, and it's assumed that because you're good at that, you'll be great at teaching too, or that you can learn that on the fly. Um, so the first day in the beginning of a faculty career is, is a lot like this. You get your parking tag, set up my email account, and everybody's doing things that seem easy um, and that are because they're just just getting you, getting you into the environment. Then somebody comes in your office and they say, all right, um, you're going to be lecturing on whatever it may be, and I'll need 10 questions for this exam by whatever date they tell you. And um, this is when, for me personally, I guess, I realized uh, there's, there's a syndrome that I had and still maybe have called the imposter syndrome. And you're like, oh, God, they're going to realize that I don't really know how to write questions well. Um, and what I ended up doing was, like a lot of us do, I went back to how I was, how I had questions when I was a student. So I remembered those questions and how faculty members wrote those. I've taken tons of multiple choice question tests in my life, so it must not be that hard to write them is what I thought. Um, and nothing could have been further from the truth. And when we look at these next couple of examples, you'll see what I mean. Um, so this one, I teach uh, shock lectures here. Um, and what I emphasized in class was that we treat the patient and not a number. And so that being the case, the fun, I, Again, it was in black and white. It was clear to the students. The fundamental problem in shock, as I told them, was decreased tissue perfusion. Um, since we can't really get audience participation here, um, I'm bearing my soul a little bit here, and I fully realize that A and B contribute to C. Um, so I'm aware that this is a bad question. Um, yeah, I guess I should say here, hello, my name is Adam, and I used to write terrible questions. Um, and this is one example of such. But the hard part is it's really hard when you write questions not to take them personal in a sense. And so um, even though it was a bad question and I can look at it now and objectively say it's bad, I still find myself making excuses as to why the students should have known it anyway. Again here, um, this is another example of a poorly written question by me. Um, there's a backstory here about an actual student activity where I was a patient in shock and they had to, they found me on the ground, bleeding out, whatever. And then what they had to do was initiate calling 911 and initiate uh, basic life support. And so I thought, well, that'd be a fun way to tie that in. And then I realized after I saw the performance that tying that in in a fun way may not be the best idea when you're writing questions. Um, so again, now this question is a real train wreck um, and I think shows that you know, using humor, um, you got to be careful with that. And then again, as you can see, all of my answers kind of meld together. If you're doing them correctly, then all of those will probably occur simultaneously. Uh, so your first action is not, it's a very poorly written question. But hopefully if you write questions like this, um, after we get done from today, you'll be getting better at it. Hey y'all, this is David. I'm just going to jump in and tell you that as we were putting um, this presentation together and Adam was showing some examples of questions he had used in class that did not perform very well, we were looking at these. He was offering them up as examples of questions that weren't very good, um, but at the same time he was defending them to us. He kept saying, you know, but I told him in class and but it was in black and white in the notes. And I think it's funny because it's easy to acknowledge sometimes that you need to work on them but at the same time I think we all struggle with our egos a little bit and not wanting to admit at times when we could be doing better 
And for me, that's lesson number one of writing exam questions. You have to be able to be honest with yourself and consider our cases in which probably we're the problem um, and we could do a much better job at wording um, these, these assessment questions for our students and maybe not just automatically jump to the conclusion that they didn't study very hard. So after Adam had given some of these tests um, with these questions on them and the students hadn't done very well, we got together and we talked about them. When he first started here as a faculty member, I was assigned as his official mentor and so we discussed um, and I, I was thinking back to my kind of beginning period as a faculty member. I graduated pharmacy school. Um, I did a, a residency, you know, just a one-year general practice residency and ended up going into like a specialized practice in HIV. And so I would teach a lot of the HIV material in our curriculum. And I remember when I was, you know, early in those years, my methods of assessment in class were just um, overly specific. I think my struggle with test question writing is that I probably just put the bar higher than it needed to be and then I was also introducing a lot of flaws into my test questions um, that uh, guidelines would lead us away from that kind of had students struggling on my stuff at first and that I could have done a lot better job with. <clears throat> and so here we have what is the plague of academia? It's millennials, um, if you haven't seen uh, the news. <laughs> but um, that is what is so easy as a faculty member is, um, so I had these students who were not performing well on not just those, those were my worst two examples, but there's other examples that I had. But so student performance was not measuring up. And so the other faculty members I was talking to um, some of them would say, well, how are you teaching it? What methods are you using? And I'd say, well, here's what I did. And I would, you know, go through it and they'd say, okay, well, it sounds like you taught it okay. Um, so I guess maybe they just didn't study it. You know, what other exams did they have coming up? What else was going on in their lives? And anyway, it was super easy in this sense to say it was, it's the students, not me. You know, they had that other exam. They didn't study for this one. And so they just didn't do well. And that's just it, clear and simple. Um, and then you'll have other faculty members who may would tell you, um, don't give them points back <clears throat> for that question because if you do, they'll especially when you're new, they'll think that you're going to be uh, a doormat and they're going to come knocking on your door every time they miss a question that you wrote. And so you got to stay strong and you can't let them do it early because they'll get you. And so that all, you know, again, it's tempting. I think we've all shared that, but it just didn't really sit well with me. Um, because I didn't really feel like, uh, on some level, absolutely, I think there is a responsibility that the students have. Um, but then as I started looking at it, I, I kept wondering in the back of my mind, well, what if there's an element of this that does involve me? And maybe it's beyond my teaching. Um, maybe my teaching is okay, but maybe the way I'm assessing my teaching is not appropriate. Or maybe there's ways that I can improve. And about that time is when David came back in my office as my mentor. Um, and we had a nice, you know, theoretical discussion on the, the, the item writing and student phenomenon. So really the deal was we were both uh, relatively early in our um, careers as faculty members. Um, we were both struggling with how to write questions. And so, as Adam mentioned in the beginning, um, it's, it's easy to just write questions the way your professors wrote questions. We'd speak to colleagues in our department and they would, you know, basically tell us that that's how they did it. We would ask colleagues in our Department of Basic Pharmaceutical Sciences and they would mention that their major professors wrote questions this way, so um, they do it the same. Yet, when we were kind of replicating those methods of writing test questions, we were having poor performance, you know, poor stats on the questions, lots of challenges from students. And so we realized that really something has to change. Um, what we found, though, was that we didn't know what to change. So we decided to do some research. Um, and at first, it was a little bit overwhelming because educational measurement is a, it's a discipline in itself. And it's, it's broad and it's deep. And we found that there were a lot of questions that we should be asking that we probably you know, don't even know to be asking. Um, we identified some pieces of primary literature that looked at specific aspects of item writing um, and considered those, but then we came across 
some item writing guidelines. And that's what we want to talk about with y'all today. Um, there, there are multiple sets of item writing guidelines out there. Um, we chose to use these here at our institution and just, you know, as individual faculty members because um, one of the authors on here is um, on faculty at a college of medicine and we felt that that um, probably gave them a, a similar perspective to, to what we have as pharmacists. So um, in this set of item writing guidelines, it's really a review article. It looks at um, a, a large number of pieces of primary literature as well as a review of a decent number of textbooks and um, they attempt to bring all of that information and knowledge together into a, basically just a peer-reviewed list of things you should do when writing test questions. They're, the list itself I think is you know about 30 or so guidelines, um, many of which you would think are just common sense and no one needed to tell you, like use correct grammar and spelling, use correct punctuation, um, you know, include the central thought of your question in, in the stem of the question. But then there, there are others um, that I'll, I'll let Adam mention to us in a moment. <laughs> so before we go any further, um, well, first, I, I, being a varied audience, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. And so before we go further, we're going to talk about some basics on a multiple choice question. Um, the question itself, um, if you hear us refer to STEM, that's what we mean. And so, in this case, which of the following is the capital of Texas? That's our STEM. Then we have our item. Um, so then we have our actual correct answer. And so the correct answer here is starred, and that would be our key. And then these other ones would be considered our distractors. And so for this question, we would have one key and three distractors. And then, in addition to that, another thing that we'll be talking about is we're going to be talking about RPV and p-value. We're not going to go into a great deal about that. Um, there's tons that you can go into on your own. But for our sakes for today, um, when we talk about point by serial or RPV, we're referring to discrimination. And so we're talking about the students who did perform better on the exam. How do they perform on the individual question? Um, typically, the higher that number goes, the better performing um, or better discriminating that question is, meaning the students who did well did well on the question and students who did poor did poor on that single question. Um, and then the p-value is just our, our item difficulty. So how many students got it correct <clears throat> versus incorrect? Just straight out of the gate, how difficult was it is basically what our p-value tells us. And so if we're looking um, a little bit closer, what David was alluding to is um, if we're looking closer at the guidelines, and these are ones that we just went into because there are some that are contested, and they're ones that a lot of faculty members um, are, would be familiar with or things that we use commonly. And so these four guidelines in particular um, are ones that they're broken down just like they are in, for all of the other guidelines and that Aldana and the others who wrote this set of guidelines we're discussing actually list out out of all of the references they looked at how many were in support of this guideline, how many didn't cite it at all, and how many were against it. And so you can see that on these there was not 100% for or against. Um, and so this is an area for debate on a lot of these. And I think it's a great opportunity um, amongst faculty members to have discussions about these because a lot of this will, um, as we go further, you'll see that a lot of these are, again, things that we probably commonly do. Okay, so for these just next series of slides, Adam and I are going to highlight some of these um, guidelines that are listed in this review article that didn't really have universal endorsement in the resources that they examined. The first one is regarding the use of positives rather than negatives in the stem of the question. Um, the example that I have here is just a question that I've used on a previous test um, in which I broke the guideline. So the negation that's occurring is that I threw in this word except here at the end of the stem. You can also see um, this in questions that, you know, say all of the following are such and such, um, but, or when you throw in not at the end of the question. And so the problem here is that, first of all, I don't know if anybody cares, and at this point in my life, I'm not sure if I do either, but C would be the correct answer here. And so 
if a student were to answer C and get it correct, they'd be getting points, but I haven't really determined if they know how that particular drug is metabolized or eliminated from the body. And so as we look at this, this guideline document that we showed you, um, they provide a review of the pieces of literature um, regarding this particular um, guideline. And what they tell us is that, first of all, stem negation is probably only, only uh, should be used in situations in which we're trying to assess a relevant negative objective, such as when we may want a student to identify what should not be done or what should be avoided. Um, that might be the best scenario in which to use stem negation. Um, secondly, I think a consideration about this is um, it's, it's probably just generally true, and I think we would all agree that um, student achievement is best measured when we're requiring them to choose correct answers versus incorrect answers. And it kind of goes back to what I just mentioned, that if a student chose C um, and got it right, I still don't know if they know the background information about that drug or what's going on with it. So a couple of things to consider about it. As far as statistics go, um, the guidelines themselves, as I mentioned, you know, they review a lot of pieces of literature. They looked at the, the introduction of stem negation and the effects that that would have on the difficulty of the item as well as the ability of that item to discriminate, so what the RPB would be. Um, what they found is that in, in really the majority of what they looked at, Introducing stem negation had little to no effect on either difficulty or discrimination. However, there was one study that they cited that found that when you are assessing um, concepts at higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy, so not just at the knowledge level, but working up there toward application or synthesis or evaluation, if you're writing questions at that level and you introduce stem negation, um, what they find statistically is that the difficulty of the item significantly increases, but there is not a commensurate increase in the ability of that item to discriminate. So we don't see the point by serial going up as well. And I kind of have like a philosophical problem with that. I think if I'm doing things to make my questions more difficult, then I should also be um, improving my ability to discriminate between higher and lower performing students. And if I'm not doing that, if I'm just making them difficult for difficulty's sake, then I'm just personally not okay with that. And I would ask you to examine your hearts about that point too. Um, so that's the deal with the stats with STEM negation. And then I say just keep in mind um, what they recommend in the guidelines, which is that they're most appropriately used when we're measuring those relevant objectives like what a students should avoid or what they should not do. Lastly, they say if you choose to use STEM negation that you should draw some attention to that by um, putting that word, the accept or not or but, in all uppercase or bolded or italicized just to make sure that the students realize um, that that's going on in that question. Yeah, and I think to wrap that up, the other part I've noticed personally for using STEM negation is that it's a lot easier to write distractors for a STEM negation question. And so a lot of times I know when I've gone back and changed my questions, that's what I ended up doing, was I looked at them and I thought, you know, change it back. But changing it from a STEM negation to a positive is challenging, so I'm not going to say that's easy. Um, but I think that's what I found was I used it because it was easy. Now. Also speaking of easy, this hopefully will be a, um, a reprieve for everybody and we can breathe a little easier. Um, but I think the main thing here is um, describing how many distractors do we need. So we all know standard multiple choice has A, B, C, D. You've got four options, so you'll have one correct answer and three distractors. If you're an overachiever, you may have a fifth or a sixth. Um, and so that being the case, that's just what we go to. Well, Haldana and Downing did a study and when they, they looked at um, four standardized multiple choice tests. And when they looked and examined those four multiple choice tests, they found that two thirds of all the items only had one to two effectively performing distractors. 
and then less than 10% actually had three effective distractors. And then they also saw there was no measured effect on difficulty, but that the more effective distractors you have, the more discrimination you get. So I think if it didn't come through by the how many times I said the word effective in this, um, that becomes the nice thing here. I think in that it's all about effective distractors. It's not about just having things in order to have four options for a multiple choice question. This is actually one of the most studied uh, examples in the guidelines. Um, there's been a lot of empirical study on this. Of the studies that have been done, there's been um, seven that were done. Five of them showed that having fewer options um, made it less difficult, made the question less difficult. Then there were two that found there was no difference. And my suspicion and what I'm um, going to tell you guys is that I believe when you decrease the number of distractors, as long as they are effective distractors, it'll be, it's fine. Now I don't want you guys to use this as a license to go around and only have three options. Um, I think we should strive to have a fourth option, but if you have a really difficult question and you only have three options and the fourth option either would make no sense um, or is just a throw-in option that you're putting in there just to have a fourth option, then it is okay to, to delete that fourth option. Um, and the guidelines say that that would be okay. Three should be okay. <clears throat> and so that was a really nice thing for me um, because I, I know for, there's no telling how many hours I spent trying to think of that fourth option. And now there is some literature out there saying you don't have to think of it, but I think the harder thing is making your making sure that your options you give the students are effective and that they're really sound distractors. And I'll say um, from an ExamSoft standpoint, one really nice thing that ExamSoft allows us to do is if you put all of your questions in ExamSoft and if you house them there and reuse them from year to year, ExamSoft gives you very nice um, longitudinal or, or should I say collective sure. historical data on these items. And so you can go back and look at your performance of your distractors. How many students actually chose that distractor? And then you can improve that question and use it again the next year. And as long as you change it and keep it in ExamSoft, it will keep up with those changes. And you'll be able to look from year to year and see on that item um, what the performance of it is. So I think ExamSoft gives us a great opportunity to improve those distractors and if you, find, if you pull a question up and it has zero students who selected that option, then maybe it's one we need to think about deleting that and then see how it works the next year and see how it affects your, um, your statistics for that item. Okay, the next um, guideline that we want to look at that was kind of disagreed upon based on the resources examined is this use of none of the above. And I wish I could hear all of you who are listening right now so you could tell me whether or not y'all routinely use this in your questions. I know that, you know, I have. I know Adam has. Um, I think it's just one of those easy distractors to add on to your list when you're looking for one more. But I do think that the introduction of this does kind of affect the stats of your question, and that's something that we should be aware of. And there are some other, other considerations, too. Um, so I'll tell you all, Adam mentioned bearing his soul earlier, so I'll bear mine right now. A, a while back, I was doing a development program at the university level here at our institution. We have um, faculty development at the beginning of each semester university-wide, and different people from different disciplines are invited to talk about certain topics, and I was talking about exam questions. And I was using this particular question in, um, in that talk and I mentioned that, you know, were I a student and having to select the right answer, I would choose E because I know that the capital of Texas is San Antonio. And the looks in the room immediately let me know that I was an idiot. Um, I think I turned 10 shades of red. Um, <laughs> They, they informed me that the capital of Texas is Austin, and I'll probably never forget that now. But you know what? I'm a pharmacist. I'm not a whatever person memorizes all the state capitals. So 
<laughs> is there a name for that? I don't yeah. know. It's, I don't. I don't know. Um, but I think what it ended up doing was illustrating a problem with none of the above pretty clearly, which is that you can select the right answer with misinformation, kind of similar to what I discussed a moment ago with stem negation. With this one, if a student chooses E and if E is the correct answer, you really don't know if they know what the capital of Texas is. So again, I think items are better designed if we're having students choose um, the, cor the correct answer and have it be clear to us that they actually know what the correct answer is. Um, as, as far as the agreement between the different resources and the guidelines go, 44% of those resources reviewed agreed that if we use none of the above, it should be used very carefully. Another 48% of those said that we should not be using none of the above at all. And then the remaining um, number just did not cite this particular characteristic that you can include in your items. And so, you know, I, I kind of wonder why do 40 8% of, of those resources think that we should not be using none of the above at all. And I think it comes down to the effects um, that this can have on your item stats. There were several different studies that looked at both difficulty and discrimination that were described in the guidelines. There were um, five looking at difficulty and four looking at discrimination. All five reported that use of none of the above drastically increases the difficulty of a question. So across the board, difficulty is increased. Um, three of the four studies failed to demonstrate a difference in discrimination. So again, we're going back to the, the personal problem I have with this, which is that if we make a question more difficult, we also need to be able to better discriminate between higher and lower performing students. If that's not happening, then we need to reevaluate what we're doing. So, in, in some courses we've done, we've talked about whether we should use none of the above or not. At this point, it's something that we try to avoid. Um, however, there, you know, guidelines are guidelines. They're not rules, they're recommendations. And so there are definitely instances in which it would be appropriate to break them. Um, I think we found that, you know, as we review the historical performance data that ExamSoft makes available to us, if we have items that are just really easy, um, just maybe too easy, then we sometimes consider adding in none of the above. Um, it's not something that's done routinely, but it's a conversation that we've had, and I still personally don't know how I feel about that, because if we're not increasing discrimination, then I'm generally not in favor. Um, I would say one other thing to consider about none of the above is that I'll speak for pharmacy students. Um, it's probably the same for medicine and other health professionals, but our students are um, classic overthinkers. So they, they can just spin those gears in their heads when they're taking a test and just think, think, think. Um, and, and I think none of the above makes that a bit of a problem because if, if you offer them the option of none of the above and it's not the correct answer in your opinion, especially with higher level questions, if the students in their overthinking are able to come up with some theoretical answer that could potentially be more correct than any of the ones that you've provided, um, they could very well choose none of the above. Um, and that could easily lead to challenges to questions when they give you their very elaborate thought process that led them to choose that, um, that particular distractor. So consider summary here, you can get these questions correct even if you don't know the answer, like I did with the capital of Texas, um, they, in all of the research that was reviewed for these guidelines, none of the above, always increased difficulty, and the majority of the time we did not see a corresponding increase in discrimination. And along the same lines, but nicely for us, the correlate of none of the above would be actually the other easy option to put in there, which is just to add in an all of the above. Um, it's an easy distractor, and so because you don't have to think about it, you just put it in there. And so, what we see with it is that actually they don't even say consider carefully or anything else because um, they just flat out say avoid all of the above, which is nice. So it's kind of cut and dry. Seventy percent of the references cited actually agree. I won't go through the details in this question in particular and talk about it, but I will talk talk in generalities here, 
is that immediately when you introduce all of the above as a distractor um, or just in general in a question, even if it is the key, um, the problem is that one of two things will occur. One is a student who has no idea about what the right answer is, majority of times will just select all of the above. Another problem is that this then becomes a a mind game for the students. They don't have to think because when you see all of the above, then now you have two options. One is I can find one of the distractor, one of these answers that's incorrect, and then I know if it's incorrect, all of the above's incorrect. And then the flip side of that, if I can find any two of these that are correct, then I know that the correct answer is all of the above. And so you may have some very good information or some very critical concepts that you want students to know that are in your answer choices, but because you've introduced all of the above and even that is the answer, they may read it and actually learn something during your question, which is not the goal. Um, so that being the case, we really try and just say, don't use all of the above. Now, that's a really hard thing to do. Um, the thing that's nice about it is there, there's a few pretty just straightforward and easy ways to change that. One being you can just make it a multiple true false. So just take all of the above out and make it a multiple true false. The other one is that we can make it a select all that apply. So take out all of the above, just put select all that apply. And if you're going to use that, make sure that you emphasize select all that apply. So bold it, underline it, make sure students are aware that it is a select all that apply. Then when you do those changes, also be aware that that is going to definitely increase your difficulty. So the reason why they say avoid all of the above and what you will see is that it actually decreases the reliability because of the potential for queuing. And so when you have that queuing and students being able to, to cognitively work through a, a question, it decreases reliability and can hurt your stats. When you take that out, what you're doing is increasing that difficulty because you're not allowing students, it pretty much is making it where you know it or you don't. You can't guess your way to it. And so be aware of that. Um, you've got to be very cautious in doing it because a lot of times what we found here is that we have faculty members who may have a, let's say, affinity for all of the above. And if they have a bulk of material on the test, then you're talking about really affecting your test uh, your test statistics as a whole if you move all of those all of the above to a select all of the apply. So we have to be careful when we're making those changes, but making the changes is still, um, uh, I think, very important and something that we should strive to do. But just be careful when you're doing it and to take that into consideration. So after this point, me and David have found these guidelines. If we go back to our kind of personal stories, um, we found these guidelines. We've read them. They make a lot of sense to us and they present some very practical ways to improve questions. And so we start really feeling like, hey, this is, this is something I can do. And I personally, I start feeling like I can intelligently talk about questions. Um, I can start talking about item stats, and I can talk about distractors, and I feel like I can legitimately critique another faculty member's question because I have the, the guidelines in the back of my mind and I have that to think about. Um, and so then we're like, well, let's just give it a shot. We start, we decided we're going to try it out. Um, it couldn't get any worse, obviously, from how my questions were written. Um, and so we decided we'd give it a shot and we'd go forward with it. Yeah, so really going forward with it for us was incorporating it into the exam questions that we were writing that for the content that we were responsible for. Um, we found that we were having fewer student challenges. Um, we were having a better mix of difficulty and discrimination in our items. And we thought this would be something really cool to take to the faculty, but they probably need more than just some anecdotal evidence from us talking about personal experience. And so we decided to design a couple of really small projects to try to collect some data that we could present, but also um, more closely examine some of these guidelines that weren't really agreed upon and, and see what the effects were when we used them in our program. So I'm going to let Adam talk about the first one real quick. Yeah, and so I think a healthy skepticism is a good thing. And so this first study, what we really did was just say, 
okay, the guidelines are there, these people have written these things, but does it matter? Is there any, like, should we be doing that? Um, is there any benefit to it? So whenever we were thinking about that, uh, we came up with this idea to do just a retrospective study, take an entire course that was given over one semester and look at every single question that, were, that was on all the exams. And then for each question, look at did it, was, did it break the guidelines or did it adhere to them? And so that's what we have here. We looked at um, over 130 questions in one course that we were spread out over um, four exams of, with multiple faculty members. And you can see um, a few, there's some, some positives and negatives here. I think one of the things that I was really impressed with was that almost half of our questions actually um, adhered to the guidelines. So I was really shocked at that. I thought we were going to do much worse. Um, now, still, granted, a slight majority were flawed, um, but that was not surprising. And then you can see which guidelines we broke. And a lot of these are common ones, uh, for especially in pharmacy. So the minimized reading, um, it's very tempting as a clinician to write very meaty and meaningful patient cases that you saw in real life and try to tie in what you're teaching to this is a real life patient. But what we saw was that you end up with all these extraneous details that don't really matter in terms of getting the question correct or not. And so that was one of our most common ones, all of the above, um, as we mentioned earlier. That was another one, one of our common um, issues here. And then we have complex item format being the type K. The guidelines kind of recommend us shying away from that. But the real proof in the pudding for us and the real thing that we took away from this was when we looked at this, the standard items are those that adhere to the guidelines. The students actually did better on that. Um, the actual numbers here, eight, they, the percent correct here was 83.7% for the standard versus 76.3% for the flaw. And so we saw there was a difference, a little bit over 7% difference over an entire course for standard versus flawed questions. And then when we looked at it for discrimination, we didn't see any difference in discrimination. It was 2.42 uh, for the standard versus 2.55 for the flawed. And so the discrimination wasn't there, but there was a difference in the actual uh, student performance. And 7%, we were we really thought, wow, that's enough that that could potentially be um, a letter grade for a student. And that was um, sort of the first little bit of seeing how I write questions may actually matter. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Let me pull this slide up real quick. OK, so this next one was. Um, prospective as opposed to the retrospective one that Adam just discussed. Since in that first one we were looking backwards, we thought if we're going to bring this to the faculty, we need to have something that's looking prospectively um, kind of a more controlled um, style study. So in our curriculum at the time, we had a series of mile marker exams, which were kind of large knowledge-based exams that students took at the end of each of the years of didactic instruction. Um, they were 100 questions long, and um, they, they provided just formative assessment. So the students would take them, they would receive category reports that we generated from ExamSoft, and they could see how well they performed in a variety of areas. We asked our administration if we could add 20 questions to, to the first exam, the one in, in the P1 year. So it would go from a 100 question exam to be a 120, the final 20 questions, though, would be questions that we added to look at these specific guidelines. So we talked to some faculty members who had content on the exam anyway, and we asked them to write us an additional 20 questions. So we had um, what we called the standard form questions, which were 20 questions that adhered to the guidelines. We were specifically looking at those we discussed today, stem negation, um, none of the above, all of the above, and the number of distractors. And then in the what we call the flawed form, we asked them to rewrite the same question, testing the same content, but breaking the guidelines in one of these specific ways. 
So we had um, five questions for each of these guidelines, five that adhered to them and five that broke them. Um, we had a standard form of the exam that had the 20 standard items and a flawed form that had the extra 20 flawed items. And then we just kind of had a convenience randomization of students as they walked into the room. They would pick up one form of the exam or another. Um, when we analyzed the results, we found uh, that they were very similar to what Adam just described in that retrospective look, which is that the, the questions that were flawed or that broke the guidelines were about, you know, roughly 10 percentage points lower uh, or, or more difficult um, when we're looking at, uh, at difficulty specifically. And for discrimination, we again found that there was not a statistically significant difference in that. So here again, we had questions breaking the guidelines resulting in um, more difficulty but no better discrimination. This was, you know, controlled, it was prospective, and so we felt like we've got some pretty good data now to bring to our faculty, and we've done that since then. We've done a few development programs in which we presented this, these data, um, discussed some of, our, um, some of our experiences with these items and implementing them in our courses, and since then, we've even had some courses that have adopted formal item review sessions before each exam within their course. A lot of our courses here are team taught. They could have eight or ten instructors in them. And sometimes you could have that many instructors on the same exam. And so it is really helpful to be able to get people in the same room to talk about the test questions before you administer it to the students. You're able to find a lot of issues and correct them up front. And in doing this, we've we've leaned very heavily on the guidelines that we mentioned today and we talked specifically about the ones that we discussed specifically today because people tend to have opinions about those. And so with that we're going to kind of wrap it up and let you guys ask any questions that you have um, for us that we make an answer. And Simon Cowell is on here not because we're judging you. We are certainly not experts. We just think he's funny. Yeah, that's not David. Although I guess they could resemble if Simon was blonde. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. That was a, a wonderful presentation. We are going to go ahead and open the forum up for Q and A Q&A, uh, right now. So if you have questions for the presenters, now is the time to insert them into the questions area of the GoToWebinar control panel, which is on the right hand side of your screen. You can just type them in. I will read them out and we'll uh, go with that format. Um, we already do have a couple that have come in, guys, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. Okay. Okay. First question is, how are you adjusting items that perform poorly statistically? Throw out, bonus point, give everyone credit, or keep as is? That is a fantastic question, and I wish there was a black and white answer for it. Um, unfortunately, it all becomes very dependent on what the item stats were what the content of the question was. Um, typically what we will do here based on item statistics um, is if it is a difficult question, typically we look at all questions that have less than 50 percent of the students get it correct. We look at all of those. Um, I would say personally if less than 30 percent of the class gets it correct then that's a very challenging question. The, so for me, if less than 30% of the class gets it correct, um, but it has a fantastic RPB, like 0.4 or somewhere in that range, then that tells me that it was a hard question, but that the students who were prepared for the exam did well on it. So that would be an example of when I would give that as a bonus question, because I feel like those students deserve that, who studied and who performed well on it. Um, but then conversely, if there's no discrimination change, so the, the question discriminates poorly and all the students did poorly on it, um, it depends on what the content is and who taught it. I'll usually have a discussion with the, the faculty member who wrote the question um, and ask them their opinions because sometimes it is, sometimes it's okay for students to miss questions if they don't study and if it's considered to be, you know, very critical or important information. I think it's okay to have a challenging question that students do poorly on. Um, 
but you just have to kind of use it on a case by case basis. David, anything to add? I mean, I'll just jump in and say that we have an associate dean of assessment that's um, kind of cited some guidelines that she's found in the educational measurement literature, and she asks us to scrutinize any questions that have difficulties of less than 0.45 um, and point by serials of less than 0.15. Uh, I think, you know, if you were to read the literature, what's generally suggested is point by serial correlations of greater than 0.2 are desirable. Um, and I am no psychometrician, but I think that that's really in the context of large exams with lots of students taking them. Um, with smaller groups, um, like you would see in pharmacy school or medical school or, you know, just other, other classes in higher education where you've got less than 100 students or around 100 students in a classroom, what I've been told and what I've seen in a few resources is that point by serials of greater than 0.15 are acceptable as well. So like I said, she recommends we scrutinize them at less than 0.45 difficulty and less than 0.15 on the point by serial. Around here, it's class by class or instructor by instructor whether they want to drop the question totally, which reduces the denominator um, and can kind of weight the other exam items a little bit more. I personally don't like that because a student can have their grade go down after that item is removed. Um, uh, or you can offer it as a bonus, and I kind of feel like it's just personal preference. Fantastic. Thank you. Next question is, in that last exam you talked about that had a difficulty level without added flaw questions of 55%, that seems like a very difficult exam. Is this typical? Okay, so again, on that exam, it was a mile marker exam, um, which covered all the material they had seen in an entire year of school, and it was, it was meant to provide them with formative assessment only. So for that sequence of exams, that actually was typical performance. That was pretty consistent from year to year. Um, we've actually even moved away from that model of mile marker exams and we've gone with a, a national benchmarking exam now. But were that a classroom exam, I would have had a heart attack. Because though it was provided purely for formative feedback for students, it was a level that we were comfortable with. Okay, next question is, how do you explain the difference between the same item's performance from one exam to another or one year to another? How would you adjust the item in this case? That's a good question. I think if I had a, an item on an exam that performed well one year and did not perform well another year, I would have to look at what I was doing um, in the classroom and how I was delivering the content. Um, you know, I would wonder if I or another instructor had provided additional examples in one year versus another or offered an opportunity to interact with material in a case kind of situation. Um, but knowing how the admissions process goes for our school anyway, each cohort of student that comes in is basically equivalent academically at baseline. And so I really think I would have to look at the content delivery in the classroom and how it was supported by additional assignments. And I, yeah, I think you have to look at what you can control. That's the use of, of questions. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, you can't get lost in item statistics and looking at individual items. At some point, you have to bring it back to a larger scale. And I think going back to what you're doing in the classroom is a great example of that. Um, but I think you come into a ton of variability. Um, it may even come down to, I mean, let's just be honest, maybe there was test leak, maybe <laughs> students are aware of the question, and so that's why it's become better. Maybe the question didn't really, the learning didn't change, but students were aware of it. Um, so you, there's so many different variables, it's really hard to pin down um, what changed in that case if it's the same question. Okay, next question is, I've noticed that it's hard to have outside or guest lecturers writing questions and they like to use none of the above, all of the above, etc. How about outside speakers in their question writing? Um, I've had some guest speakers in a course that I coordinate and 
I dealt with that by asking them if I could have permission to modify anything I wanted to. <laughs> and also, uh, I've, I've sat down with them on the front end because when they're developing their lecture for me, um, first of all, I want to be sure that we have very clear lecture objectives so the students know what they're about to be presented with. Then I need to make sure that the lecture content aligns with those. And then, you know, if you're not in higher education or in an education field, I think you can lose sight of the fact that your test questions really should align to those initial lecture objectives. So I try to do that all up front with an individual who's guest lecturing for me, um, but also I think having permission to make modifications helps as well. Okay, next question is, do you give students feedback on their performance on exam items? For example, do you meet with the class to review the exam and explain right and wrong answers? That's done differently in different courses in our curriculum. Um, I think the most common thing here is that we would identify students in that lower 27% based on the strengths and opportunities report that ExamSoft gives you. Um, we, if, if those items are coded, and I prefer that they are and encourage the faculty to do so, um, we would release the, um, the strengths and opportunities report to the student. Um, and I'm sorry if I mentioned the, the lower 27% is on the summary report. So we would release the strengths and opportunities reports to the students that tells them, usually if, if we're coding, it's going to be based on unit of material. So they can see for each block of material represented on the exam how they perform and, and also in relation to how the entire class performed on those blocks. We give them an opportunity to review that um, and then they come to our office ready to discuss um, mechanisms for improvement or ideas that they could implement to help themselves improve. And at that point, in the office, we'll also print a missed item report for them so they can see the specific questions that they missed and have an opportunity um, to ask the faculty member any questions while they're in there. Those missed item reports are not just given to the students. They're taken back up before they leave um, and shredded because we do have a considerable number of questions that are used from year to year. Yeah, there's considerable. I mean, I think it's actually a great thing, a great learning tool that's underutilized in education is student performance on an exam. But to the level of going over um, RPBs and p-values with students, um, I think that's a little more than can be beneficial for them. But having them think through their performance on an exam um, and using some metacognition in that process um, is something that interests me a, a pretty good bit, and I've in, been involved with some other faculty members on doing some research there. And I think it's a great opportunity for the students. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we are out of time for today. Uh, we do have several more questions that are kind of sitting in limbo right now. We will reach out to all of those question posers individually. Uh, so don't worry, we'll make sure that we get, we get in contact with you. I want to thank everybody for taking time uh, out of their day to attend today. Just as a quick follow-up, when you click out of the webinar today, you will get a quick pop-up. It's a five-question survey. We would really appreciate you taking the time to fill out those quick five questions so that we can continue providing relevant content at all of these presentations. Um, also, this webinar has been recorded. You will receive a link to the recording as well as a link to the PDF version of this uh, presentation deck within the next 48 hours, so be on the lookout for that. Please feel free to share that with uh, anyone you would like. Um, also, um, just as a, as a quick update, we do have a, another webinar this coming Thursday and then four or five webinars uh, within the next four weeks. You can see an entire list with descriptions and the registration pages at resources.examsoft.com. Thank you so much to both David and Adam. Great presentation, guys. We appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.